Only in America. 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 This week, let's travel to the Deep South, where the fight for racial justice offers important lessons to the push for immigrant justice. And so we're informed about what happens locally, and then we speak up into um, into the larger uh, situation in America and, and uh, you know, try to tell a better story. And that's what I always talk about. How do we tell a better story of what our community is and what it could be and what our churches are doing and how we're reflecting God's heart for people? And then how do we speak that to the powers that be? Because they need to hear from us. From the National Immigration Forum, I'm Ali Nirani, and this is Only in America. In recent years, if not weeks, we've seen how fear can take hold across the United States and bring out the worst in our communities. Fear of losing your way of life, fear of people who are different than you, fear that your beliefs are being threatened. In the struggle for racial justice in America, we are saddled with national leadership who are more than happy to exploit these fears, which leaves us, all of us, to look to each other to be the ones who get out of our comfort zones, who create conversations, relationships, organizations that bring communities together. Trust me, I live in Washington, D.C. Now is not the time to look to national leadership to meet this moment. We can only truly be a nation of justice when we move past the impulse to protect ourselves against others who are different, whether they belong to a different race, culture, religion, socioeconomic status, or country of origin. Rather than seeing perceived others as threats to our way of life, Americans need to look at the real threat to our values, the systems that uphold injustice and inequality. This impulse of fear isn't exclusive to one region of the country, and it's not unique to communities of any particular political persuasion. As we've seen this summer in Minnesota, New York, Kentucky, Wisconsin, and more, these fears are tangible in communities across the nation. But today, We're taking a closer look at parts of the Deep South through its history of harm and hope to see what we can apply to the future. We want to hear from you. What do you want to hear more about on Only in America? Do me a favor and take our two-minute survey at immigrationforum.org slash podcast. We really appreciate your feedback. Support for the National Immigration Forum comes from the Carnegie Corporation of New York, supporting innovations in education, democratic engagement, and strengthening international peace and security. And from Humanity United. When humanity is united, we can bring a powerful force for human dignity. Here's what you'll hear on a new podcast called A Better Life. Great stories of immigrants grappling with the meaning of America during the coronavirus pandemic, and immigrant elders offering humor and advice for the rest of us trying to make it through these difficult times. At A Better Life, the host and virtually all the reporters are immigrants or the children of immigrants. A Better Life comes from Feet in Two Worlds, winner of multiple awards for journalism about and by immigrants. Listen to A Better Life wherever you get your podcasts. In 2019, the National Immigration Forum Board of Directors and Leadership Staff visited Montgomery, Alabama for a retreat to plan what comes ahead. But before we met, we spent two days learning about the region and its history. Among the places we went to, we visited the Equal Justice Initiative's Legacy Museum and National Memorial for Peace and Justice. And most importantly, we walked to the streets of Montgomery, visiting the spots that were slave markets, churches, places of protest. Our tour guide and instructor that day, if you will, was Alan Cross. These days, he's the pastor of Petaluma Valley Baptist Church in Northern California. But Alan is from New Orleans and grew up in South Mississippi. Before he moved to California, in fact, he was a pastor in Montgomery for 16 years. His family has 200 years of history in the Deep South. I first got to know Alan in 2013 when he worked with churches across the Southeast to help them engage their immigrant and refugee neighbors with the Evangelical Immigration Table. He's the author of When Heaven and Earth Collide, 
racism, Southern evangelicals, and the better way of Jesus. But more than anything, Alan is a dear friend and, as you'll learn, just good people. My first question for you is, why race and faith? Why did you decide you're going to dedicate so much of your life and your your mental bandwidth uh, and your spiritual bandwidth, if you will, to race and faith? Well, that's a you know that's a good question. Um, I'm from the South. I'm a, a son of the South. I'm as Southern as anyone can be. Uh, heritage I can trace my ancestry back to the 1600s in Virginia, North Carolina. On all sides, fought in the Civil War for the Confederacy. I have ancestors who owned slaves. I was raised evangelical and became Baptist and uh, became a, a Southern Baptist minister. And uh, the South is my context, is my world. Um, I went to seminary out in California with, at a Southern Baptist seminary, but then came back and, and worked as an associate pastor and a senior pastor at a Baptist church in Montgomery, Alabama. And, uh, you know, Montgomery was the birthplace of the Confederacy, first capital of the Confederacy. It was a major, major slave trading center. It became the primary slave trading market in, uh, in America before the Civil War. And then it was the, the birthplace of the civil rights movement. So you have this history that swirls around you. I'm a history guy, uh, uh, trained as a history teacher in college at Mississippi State, and I have always had that context of everything. I, I see the big picture. And so in the early 2000s, when I was beginning in ministry, you still had churches that were separated racially. There wasn't a lot of coming together, even though there were movements and there was talk of reconciliation, and that was always around us. And so I wanted to dig into those questions and figure out why you had Christians uh, who were black and Christians who were white. Why are we still separated? Why are we still living in different areas and neighborhoods and a part of different groups and different churches? And uh, the answers that I was given is that that's just the way things were and things are better now. And we've solved all these problems. I would look around and I would think, well, things don't seem solved, you know, and this is affecting our churches. It's affecting our witness. If we can't get this right, how do we, you know, hold out the gospel uh, to the world when we can't get along or we can't come together with each other? So those were the questions that animated me. And being in Montgomery, uh, learning stories about racial violence and um, that there were white Christians involved in this. There were people who went to church who were also engaging in violence against African-Americans. And so I wanted to understand why. And so that kind of set me on a quest of exploration that then culminated in the book, When Heaven and Earth Collide, Racism, Southern Evangelicals, and the Better Way of Jesus. And early 2014 is when that came out. But I spent years researching and studying using my history background and trying to get to the answers of why things were the way they were and how we could address them today from a biblical and a spiritual perspective. So as you were researching the book over years and, and putting it together, was there something that you can look back on in that research process and that writing process that surprised you then, but you're seeing playing out now as you know the Black Lives Movement takes such a rightfully prominent role in, in the national debate? You know, it, it was kind of scary, actually. Um, so much of the work that I did and things that I, were, I was seeing from the past, uh, history is a great teacher, and we should listen to what history teaches us. And so that's what I was doing. I, I was going back so I could understand the moment I lived in and possibly understand where things might be headed. And I didn't quite understand that what I was picking up on in 2008, 9, 10, 11, as I was researching this and working through it, I, I was picking up on the swells that were building. Um, again, I was thinking this was all kind of in the past and that we were really trying to move forward. You know, we we're talking about a post-racial society and that things were solved. But then there were these emerging movements um, that were kind of working against that. And, uh, and so when the book came out in February of 2014, you know, that was about six months, seven months before Ferguson erupted. Uh, and then you had you know, the riots in Baltimore. And then you had just all of these events that have taken place, you know, with refugees, um, of the Syrian refugee backlash and movements against immigrants and things like that. And they all began to emerge. I, and, and, you know, as you said, as, as we met in 2013, there were things happening before that, but there was more, it seemed like more on a positive trajectory. But I was looking back and I was looking at these undercurrents and I was, I was seeing the things that were actually going to begin to break out in the next couple of years. And I'm really, uh, I'm working through the book right now with a group of people from my church and some other folks, and I'm reading this stuff from the book. And I'm just shocked at, again, how how prescient it was and how how much we were digging into in that research, what happened, how, how present today. One of the main things, um, you know, what surprised me um, is this idea of protect your way of life, promote, protect and defend your way of life. And that really is the underlying animation behind what we see, I think, with racial division and with concern about immigrants and refugees and the other and people coming from other places, um, is that there's a fear that my way of life might be altered or I might lose something if I um, allow these barriers to be crossed. And if I allow this 
this culture that that is very comfortable to me and to my people and to my family if I allow it to be altered uh, by the presence of others or the concerns of others. And so that was a real strong uh, mindset before the Civil War, where Southern planters uh, who were trying to protect slavery. If you go back and read original documents and speeches and uh, you know things in papers, the idea of the Southern way of life uh, was was being held up. And then after the Civil War, with the Lost Cause ideology that emerged to try to reclaim a sense of honor and dignity from the defeat that happened in the Civil War, the idea of protect, promote, and defend my way of life was also very prominent. And that moves into the civil rights movement. And then, you know, you hear that talk today that the American way of life is under threat by others, by foreigners, by people who want other things. So whereas the the actual situation might change, some of the underlying uh, animation behind it is the same. And so I began to think that racism wasn't the core issue. Slavery wasn't America's original sin, that the core underlying issue was protect, promote, and defend my way of life over and against others if need be. And as a Christian pastor, I do believe that the cross of Christ tells a better story of sacrificial love. So what I've done is I've called people to move towards sacrificial love towards others as opposed to protecting myself against others. And so that's kind of the of the movement that I went through as I researched and wrote. So you just said something that's really interesting and wanted you to, to unpack a little bit. You know, racism wasn't the country's original sin. It was protecting your way of life. You speak to that a little bit more because it feels like those two things are also deeply, deeply connected. They are, yes. Um, and, and, and I say protect, promote, and defend. Um, defend and protect are about the same thing, but but promote as well. You know, so you have manifest destiny, for example. You know, where we're going to expand, um, even at the expense of others who are already here. Uh, you know, the way that slavery uh, expanded into the into the deep south from the coastal states. Uh, living in Montgomery, I would give uh, city tours based on my book, and I would have groups come in and church staffs, and and so kind of working through these tours of of the city and the slave market that existed there. And and I tell the story about it. If you were a white Christian, Montgomery, Alabama, in 1835, 1836, you would walk down the streets with the sound of chains clanking all around you because you had thousands of African slaves or, or slaves who's, who descended from Africa, but from the states of Virginia and North and South Carolina being brought in to be sold in the marketplace to, to fill the plantations around Montgomery. And then you would also have the, the rattle of chains of Creek Indians being moved out of the area um, through Indian removal so that white settlers could then take the Creek lands. And so there were just thousands of people being moved in and shipped out so that this city could develop and, and the society could develop. Wayne Flint, uh, Auburn history professor in 1980, wrote a book about Montgomery. He said that Montgomery was a city built on slavery. And so you have this history that existed. And then it had these effects that continued on and that people kept playing off of what happened before. And so whereas the general understanding is that slavery is America's original sin, I think it goes deeper than that. A slavery is a manifestation. Racism is a symptom of the deeper sin of protect, promote, and defend my way of life, which then manifests in a lot of different ways. Racism being a key historical way that it manifests, but racism itself doesn't explain everything that's happened. Uh, there's this underlying uh, impulse that I have to protect myself against others. And so if you're in the South, it might manifest as white racism. If you're in California, it might have manifested towards um, indigenous peoples who lived here and they were enslaved. It might be towards immigrants. It might have been, you know, towards other groups that were coming in. But there's this deeper impulse that we keep tapping into, which is actually a really human impulse. It's happened all over the world, but it kind of took place here um, in some significant ways and then plays out racially. So that became the bridge for me to kind of the work I was doing on race to then kind of move into an awareness of how we treated immigrants and refugees as well. So oftentimes when we're working with faith communities, you know, Christian communities in particular, there's a focus on Matthew 25. I was hungry and you gave me food. I was thirsty and you gave drink. I was a stranger and you welcomed me. And, you know, my sense is that we have a tendency to focus on the word stranger in a passage in that verse. But in the chapter that you wrote for Walter's book, um, For God So Loved the World, you actually unpacked the term welcome. Is that also kind of that bridge of, okay, how do you get somebody from reacting such a defensive posture to pivoting to a different way of looking at the other? What I talk about there, I got moved into that perspective of, of looking at the word welcome by studying the anthropologist Paul Hebert and some of his work on centered sets versus bounded sets. And, um, and what he said was that in a centered set society, you have these core values, you have these core things that kind of people gravitate towards and they move towards. And so people can come from all different aspects of life or all different perspectives and they can move towards a center that everyone agrees on. But when the center isn't there, when the center isn't strong, then you create bounded sets of barriers of people who are either in or out. 
the dynamic communities that are full of life and vibrancy and creativity are the centered set communities where people understand these are the core values. This is what we're moving towards this. And anybody can participate. And so, uh, you know, having that view of the church, that Christ is at the center and that he welcomes people from all different uh, tribes and nations and ethnicities, that it's not, there's not a nationalistic church. There's not, um, you know, a white church or a black church, that there's the church that Christ has established and he is that center value. And then when we look to him and who he is and how he is actually our savior and he's the head of the church, then people can come from all different walks of life and move towards him. And the ones who are moving towards him are the ones that we're brothers and sisters with. And so that idea of welcome. So when, when Jesus talks about in Matthew 25, welcome the stranger, that the Greek word there is, is a synagogite, uh, which, which is a harvest word. It's a word where, where you go and you bring together the harvest, like the wheat harvest, and you gather all the tares together. Um, you have this huge harvest and there's a celebration that went along with that. And so synagogy becomes uh, a root. Um, it comes from the word synago, which is to welcome or to gather. And it's where we get the idea of the synagogue from, which is the Jewish gathering place where people would come together. And then that becomes kind of the prototype for the church, the ecclesia, which is uh, uh, the called out ones who, who come together. And so what Jesus is really saying when, when he talks about the stranger, the, the foreigner, um, is that we should church. We should gather them together and embrace them to ourselves. Like we should pull them in. It isn't just about shaking their hand saying, we're glad you're here, but you're actually welcoming them into your very life. And if Christ is at the center of that, if he's the dynamic center and we, we have a centered set, then when we welcome people from other backgrounds and other places into our lives, we end up sharing our lives together. And this new thing emerges, which is what the church is supposed to be, not of one ethnic group or another that dominates, but a new thing that comes together from people of all different backgrounds and all different walks of life with Jesus at the center. And when that happens, you have this really dynamic thing that creates renewal, uh, both uh, uh, in the church as well as in the community. And, that, and that's the point that I was making in the book, is that when you see communities, even that aren't Christian at all, when they're welcoming people with a dynamic center that they all agree to, and then they're embracing people from different walks of life, you have this creative power that takes place as everyone's sharing and everyone's collaborating and they're all in it together and they're moving forward together and they're all learning from each other. And then you have all this innovation that happens and we all get stronger for it. And, um, you know, I think that's the prototype for that is what the church is supposed to be. So kind of unpacking that and applying it to the immigration discussion from a Christian perspective, I think that the church and Christians have a lot to offer to this discussion, even beyond and, you know, for, for those who are non-Christians and for those who, who don't believe in, in God at all, we can, we can enter this debate and say, yeah, we have this dynamic where we can bring people together from other aspects and we can share values. And that can be a model for the rest of the community as well. And I think America has a lot of potential to reflect that as well. So this series of episodes is focused on how we think about, how we talk about, how we work on, how we address issues of racial justice and immigrant rights. How does your faith kind of help inform both of those important issues, whether it's racial justice or immigrant rights? Well, um, you know, it's, it's, it's all through scripture, uh, the call to love our neighbor, the call to consider the, the needs of others uh, ahead of our own. There's a passage that I speak to a lot in scripture from Philippians 2, where it says, that if you have any encouragement from united with Christ, any comfort from his love, any common sharing in the spirit, any tenderness and compassion. So basically, if you know Jesus at all, if you have any relationship with Jesus, then he says to, to, uh, to have the same mind, to have the same love, be one in spirit and purpose. And then it says in verse three, do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit, rather in humility, value others above yourselves, not looking to your own interests, but also to the interest of others. And I think that Christians have an incredible opportunity in the midst of all that's happening, because so much of it, so many of the people who are immigrants or who are, are talking about racial justice, these are conversations happening within the church. These are Christians, um, you know, on, on all sides of this discussion. If we would just consider the interest of others ahead of our own, all of us, if we would listen to others, if we would listen to what others are saying and not just assume that because that's not my experience, then it's invalid, but actually hear from other people and then put the interest of others ahead of our own. And I'm speaking as a white evangelical Christian right now. If I would listen to the interest of others and the needs of others and what they're saying is going on, then I'm going to be uh, uh, more attuned to how to love my neighbor. I'm going to be able to listen better and I'm going to be able to hopefully step in and address some of these issues in partnership with ethnic minority communities. But they need to lead the way. They need to, to tell us and we need to listen and we need to work with them in, in many ways. And I think that that how do we live together? How do we love each other? How do we you know, care about one another in a community whenever these things happen, when there is a police shooting, when there is violence that breaks out, when you know, there are things that are happening in our communities that um, are detrimental to everyone, crime and, and uh, education problems and all types of things. We can all work together to solve these. But that's really hard to do if we're running away from each other. And it's really hard to do if we're saying we don't want to listen 
and we know best and we're protecting our way of life. This gets into what I was saying before, that that protect, promote, and defend my way of life over others, it becomes a barrier to solving these things. And we have to tear that barrier down so we can work together. We've talked about this quite a bit of kind of, you know, having a, an organizing strategy that based on engaging people on values. But at some point you get to a series of really difficult policy questions. Again, kind of whether it's through the immigration reform perspective or with regards to racial justice, how do you approach that? You know, ultimately, yes, we have to change the systems. Um, and there's a process to help the public and particular audiences understand that there are systemic reforms that are needed in order to you know, make a better world. But, you know, those systemic reforms are just hard for people to understand. Yeah, they are. And they often get captured by, you know, political rivalries and, and people don't trust, you know, we don't trust each other. Uh, we hear about, a, you know, here's a reform that can change things. Here's a way to help things. And then we look at who said it. And then we look at what else they've said. And we just assume that they're against us because they come from a different camp. Or even if they are in our camp, then they've aligned with other people. And so there's a, there's a huge lack of trust. And so it's getting harder and harder to agree upon how do we fix these things. And so I, I keep going back to and I keep hammering on, well, what does it mean to put the interest of others ahead of your own? What does it mean to love people? And so, you know, one shift uh, that I've had, you know, if we take dreamers, for example, you know, young people who were brought here by their parents or by others when they were young age, they didn't choose to come because in many cases they were two, three years old. They didn't even, some of them don't even know that they were brought here and they didn't find out till later. And so whenever you look at that and you say, well, what, what does it mean to love them? What does it mean to do right by them? Do you deport them? Do you send them back? to where they don't even know where to go. And so you begin to unpack this and, and you move it from the political into a moral issue. And you, you see, so you look at it morally and ethically. How can we treat our neighbor, our dreamer neighbor? What does it mean to love them sacrificially? And then as a American who can vote and who can call my congressman and who has all the rights inherent to citizenship with that gift that I have, how do I use that then to benefit this person who is in the situation where they need help? That's how I, I moved into to caring. You know, I was looking backwards to very clear uh, de jure, um, you know, policies against African-Americans where they couldn't vote and they couldn't sit at a lunch counter and they couldn't, you know, drink from water fountain. You had other things with housing and all that continue to be dealt with. But um, it was the immigration issue and seeing what was happening to children and families and, and you know, families being broken up and not being able to get right with the law and those types of things, especially with dreamers. That was the main issue that I, that I began to realize that, wait a minute, there's more to this than just to deport everybody. You know, there's more to this than the law is the law. There are ways that people have been affected by this and how do we address it from a perspective of compassion and love. And then that then fuels our view of justice, right? You know, if this person is a victim of a system, then how do we make it right for them? And so that's the, you know, what I go through. And I've had to, I've had to work through this on all these issues because I come from a conservative perspective and background where I do believe in the rule of law and I do believe in borders. And, you know, um, all those things I think are important if they're dealt with the right way. But then how, how do they play out? You know, we had uh, asylum seekers come and when you first see the caravans, you know, you have a reaction. What are they trying to do? And then you realize, well, they're coming to apply for legal asylum. You know, the law allows for that. So how do we treat them in that process? And so for me, I know this isn't for everyone, but for me, I start with always, I try to, um, the cross of Christ and what does it mean to love your neighbor sacrificially? And then I apply that into the policy sphere. And, and there are differences and people see it differently. I understand that. But that's where we can talk about it. And that's where we can hopefully work through it and um, hopefully be at a better place than just fighting with each other and distrust and all that. And all that indeed. <laughs> yeah. So, you know, when a congregant comes to you, whether you're back in Montgomery or, you know, where you are now and asks, okay, what can I do? You know, what should I do? What do you tell them? Uh, first of all, locally is where you start. Uh, when I was in Montgomery, um, you know, I, I first began to be aware of this by what was happening in my own neighborhood and what was happening around me as a pastor. And then, you know, later uh, as an educator and working on behalf of, of immigrants, and refugees throughout the South and, you know, working with the forum and working with the Montgomery Baptist Association and other groups, I would see these needs locally. And it always has to be what's happening in my neighborhood and what's happening with people around me. I'll give you an example. Uh, I'm in Montgomery and uh, I went to visit a family. It was a Hispanic immigrant family. Um, and they shared that they, you know, had, had been profiled, you know, racially. And so I had a relationship with some of the authorities in town and I saw what happened and I heard, and I went to 
the authorities and city leaders and I explained what happened and they heard about it and they said, well, that shouldn't have happened. And so they, they moved to address it within the organization where it took place. Um, you know, so I, I would just always think about how can I leverage my relationships to help people who don't have the relationships that I have? You know, that's one thing. Another thing is, is just being aware of the needs of people around you. And so, you know, the more rooted we are in relationships, the more we hear from people, the more we know what's happening in our community with people of different backgrounds and races and, uh, and cultures and experiences, the more understanding we have of what people go through and the more as a Christian, we understand what it means to love our neighbor. You know, that, that's not just a slogan. It's actually something that we do. When you step into the needs of people, you understand there are immigrants mm -hmm. all around you. There are people all around you who are struggling. And then you, you use what you have in your hands um, to try to, to help. And then as you do that, then you hear stories. And then you say, you know, um, maybe I could speak to this on a broader issue. Maybe I could call my congressman. Maybe I could write a letter. Maybe I could write an article. And so we're informed by what happens locally, and then we speak up into um, into the larger uh, situation in America, and and uh, you know try to tell a better story. And that's what I always talk about: how do we tell a better story of what our community is and what it could be, and what our churches are doing, and how we're, we're reflecting God's heart for people, and then how do we speak that to the powers that be because they need to hear from us. Well, in the background, you probably hear a big thunderstorm, so um, don't want to read anything into that, right? <laughs> I'm, I, I miss thunderstorms. I don't get those anymore on the West Coast. So. Yeah, yeah, but you get fog. I miss the fog. So, you know, working every day, what gives you hope? Um, you know, for me, it's uh, it's it, it's always it's always the person of Jesus. Yeah, I mean, reading stories about how he loved people, and I'm challenged. I'm like, do I love people this way? Am I willing to lay down my life for others? And then I then I see people doing that, and I see people who are living that out from all different backgrounds. I mean, I come at it from a Christian perspective, but whenever I see sacrificial love, because we need to care about each other enough to step into the fray and to protect people from things that come after them or from, from things that could hurt them or harm them or ways that their lives are being affected by the world we live in. And we should love them enough to even sacrifice ourselves. When I see that, that's what, that's what gives me hope. And you know, the last question I'm going to ask you just to finish this sentence, only in America, dot, dot, dot. Only in America uh, can people come together from, from all over the world, from all different backgrounds, from all different walks of life to build a better life and to make things better. And uh, I just think that's the beauty. That's the beauty of our nation. And I want to, I want to see that continue. Alan Cross is the pastor of Petaluma Valley Baptist Church in Northern California. You can learn more about Alan at our website, immigrationforum.org slash podcast. Next week, tune in to hear the story of an immigrant and author from Somalia, his journey to the U.S., and how the efforts for racial and immigrant justice are interconnected. Let us know what you want to hear on Only in America. Take our two-minute survey at immigrationforum.org slash podcast. We are really appreciative of your feedback. If you like what you hear, subscribe to Only in America on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you listen to podcasts. Only in America is produced and edited by Joanna Taylor, Megan Wetmore, and Becca Wall. Our artwork and graphics are designed by Carla Leha. I'm Ali Nirai, and I will talk to you next week. Mm -hmm.